Yeah, like Brother Mike said, I've known him for quite a few years. Actually, we moved here to this area in 1989, I believe it was. And uh, job brought me out here. I worked for uh, GTE. So uh, I was local supervisor here for several years. I, I left there in 2003. They offered a buyout, and I tell you that I've been doing uh, similar work. I travel a lot. And as I travel, I like to listen to talk radio. Anybody like to listen to talk radio? You know, I listen to all those conservative guys on the, on the radio, just kind of pass the time as I'm traveling. Um, I, I listen to guys like uh, Glenn Beck and, and uh, Sean Hannity and, and some of the other guys. It just passes the time. I don't always agree with everything they say, but uh, a lot of what they say I, I do. Um, but I was on my way over here this morning, and, um, and as I often do when I'm traveling, I, as I travel, sometimes I, I'll, something will hit my mind, and I'll, I'll sense the need to pray. And so I'll turn it on down the radio, and I'll, I'll begin to pray. Now sometimes, and I try not to do this anymore, but sometimes I'll turn that radio down, but I, I won't turn it all the way down. I'll just turn it down just a little to it, just so you can barely hear it, so in case it catches my, something catches my attention, I can uh, turn it back up. And I try not to do that anymore, because you know, when we pray, we need to give God our, all of our attention. And I was thinking about that this morning, how sometimes we do that in our Christian walk. Sometimes uh, in our relationship to God, we we want to absorb God's truths into our life. And we want to become better servants for Him. We want to grow in His grace. Yet, we keep the, that, that volume up just a little bit and stay in tune to what the world has to offer. But that's not what God has called us to. God wants our complete attention, our complete focus. Um, I was, uh, anybody ever read the book uh, In Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer? Have you ever read that book? Nobody here? Well, I'll tell you what, I'd recommend you read that book. But I read that book uh, a couple years back. And, um, and it's, in, in the book, he's really calling us uh, believers to pursue hotly after God. And he uses the scripture. I wasn't really planning on saying this, but he, he, and sometimes that happens. I have, um, I think I have ADD. I don't know if everybody does. But I get distracted sometimes in my Sunday school class. In Sunday school class, you know, it's, it's kind of interaction. I love an interactive Sunday school class. So I'll, I'll talk and teach for a while, and then I'll solicit comments or different perspectives from the people that are in my class. And, and sometimes they'll come up with something that gets me way off on the, way off in the left field somewhere. But what was I saying to say? <laughs> um, that's one of those times I got on the left field. Oh, Tozer. Uh, but what he is talking about, he's really, he, he, he is calling us to, a, to pursue hotly after God. And he uses this illustration, and it's in the Old Testament, I didn't write it down. But it it's talking about the heart that, that is our deer who is drinking the water at the brook. And he says, so as he, the deer panteth after the water, so my heart panteth for you. Well, that, that word panteth, uh, it is longing. It's a longing for God. It's a longing to, to that deep, intimate relationship with God. And, you know, so in another part of his book, he's talking about the mechanicalness that we have. You know, we can become what I call religiosity. We can be so set in, a, in, in routine and the way that we do things. Um, and we do all the right things. You know, we can, we can come to church on Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday. We can even up, open up God's Word and we can do a daily devotion every day. Uh, we can pray every day. But it becomes a mechanicalness. It becomes just, it, it, it becomes just something that we do. That's a habit that we form. And some of these are very good habits. And I would not, uh, you know, I would not want anyone to change those habits. But yet, there's more to our Christian walk than this mechanicalness. 
It, there's what we call substance. And, and substance is, is, is the very basis of our faith. It is, it is a relationship. It is based in relationship. And today what I was going to, um, I want to talk to you about, and, and the kickoff verse that I'm going to use is Ephesians 2.19. And it really has to do with us, um, it has to do with us understanding that we are of the household of God. It has us, that we're not part of that world. We're not part of that world system in, anymore. Now, this is, I'm being, this is being addressed to the Christian. Okay. This is being addressed to somebody who's made that commitment and decision to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And um, so when we, if, you have, if you're sitting here today and you haven't made that decision, maybe you, maybe you have been a member of this church. Maybe you've come to this church for years. Maybe you grew up in this church. Maybe, um, or maybe you're a visitor. Or, or maybe, you know, you've been stuck in a, a, in a routine of things, um, but you've never really made that commitment to Jesus Christ. You've never, you know, we've had people in our church that were in our church for years. They were members of our church. And then the Holy one one day or one service, the Holy Spirit spoke to their heart and their, and their mind. And they realized, you know, I've been doing all the right things. I've been saying all the right things. I've been experiencing, you know, I've been brothers, I thought I was brothers and sisters with everyone here. But yet, I had never made that personal commitment to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've never really started that, uh, that personal relationship. Um, it's just like uh, in, in our marriages. Hey, how many are married here? Okay, yeah, a lot of people are married. You know, we make it, when we stand, and that's a sad thing, you look at 50, even, even in the church, 50% of all married couples are, are ending up in divorce. Now, I've been almost married about almost 37 years. Well, I'm 30, we married 37. Probably some of you have been married longer than that. But you know, that's getting to be a thing of the past. You don't see those long. And I, I, I fear that as the younger generation grows up, we won't see that because the commitment isn't there. God has called us to commit. When we stand in that altar and we make that commitment to our spouse, we're making a commitment to, to, to God as well. It, it is a vow between us and our spouse and us and God. And uh, that, that should mean something. Now, I'm going to put all this, try to put all this together here in a moment. But before I get there, I, you know something, one of the, that was kind of a preview. Um, one of the things I like to do in my Sunday school class is I always like to get people smiling. <laughs> you know, there's something, that, you know, laughter is hearty for the soul. It really, um, it, it, it really, it, it, it's almost like a medication. It can really, it, it can really, you know, do something for us. And I had this little story here that I, I found that I wanted to share with you. This is someone that this is someone talking. A friend was in the front of me coming out of church one day. And the preacher was standing at the door, as he always is, to shake hands. He grabbed my friend by the hand and pulled him aside. The pastor said to him, You need to join the army of God. My friend replied, I'm already in the Lord's army, Pastor. Pastor questioned, How come I, I don't see you except at Christmas and at Easter? And he whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> now, I know something, we're all safe here today because this isn't Christmas or Easter, and we're here. So we're, I'm going to take it that we're not all in the secret service. <laughs> all right. Well, anyways, uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, before we get too much further into God's word, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you so much, Lord, for your, your mercy. Lord, we pray and thank you, Lord, for our, our salvation through Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you came and you gave your life at the cross of power so that we don't have to spend an eternity in hell paying for our sin. You took our place on the cross and we're so thankful for it. Lord, if there be somebody here 
uh, today that does not know the joy of salvation, has never really trusted you as Lord and Savior, Lord, we pray that this is the day, this, this afternoon, this morning, is the day of their salvation. We pray, Lord, they make that commitment to trust you. And Lord, for those of us that are here that have trusted you as Savior, we pray, Lord, that we would our minds would be focused on your word today, that we would put all the cares and worries that we have in other places, you know, there are other, these other things that happen in our lives, Lord, that drag us down, and, and Satan will use to drag us down. We pray that we lay them aside for the next uh, half hour, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that we would really just refocus our attention on what you have for us today, that we can really understand your principles, your truths, that we might apply these principles and truths to our lives, Lord, and uh, that we might be more like you. Uh, may this, your word, be an encouragement to our hearts today as it should be, Lord. And may your spirit have freedom, uh, Lord, to, uh, to, to, uh, to work in our lives, Lord, that we might uh, respond in a way that is, uh, is glorifying to you. We just lift your word up to you now in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. Now, I want to focus on that word household. I'm, I'm a teacher by nature, and I like to, when I get into these uh, verses, I like to, to look these verses up in the, in the Greek or the Hebrew, whatever the case might be, and really understand what these words mean. And uh, it really helps to clarify my understanding of what the Word of God is telling me. And, and as I, um, I start looking at these words, and this word household, what does the word household mean? The word household means here, belonging to a house or family, domestic, or intimate. Belonging to one's household related by blood, kindred, you know, household. We're related. Are we related by blood? Amen. Now, I think we are. If you're, if, you're, if you're born again this morning, we're related by blood. The, the precious blood of the Lamb was, was spilled for us at Calvary's cross. And you know, I've moved several times in my life. And... Uh, each time I've, I've moved, I've joined a new church family. Now, my, my, you know, my family, my, you know, my worldly family, if you would say, they, they, they stayed where they were. But when I moved, I still had family. I still had brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is what we're, we're this is the household that is being spoken of here. It's being, the, the household that is being spoken of here is the household of God. Now, how do you become part of the household of God? Well, you become part of the household of God when you answer the call of the gospel message. Really, we do nothing except for one thing. We accept it. We accept the message, the message of the gospel but because he paid it all. And there's nothing that we can do for it. You know, um, uh, but Brother Charles was speaking, and I was in the Sunday school class this, this morning. And he was talking about, uh, a little bit there at the beginning, you were talking about the importance of your, of, of your, the works that you do matching what you, what your faith is. You know, sometimes, um, and, and I completely agree with what the brother said, he said that sometimes we, are, basically we said sometimes our mouth can get in the way, and we, we do the, we, we say the talk, but we don't walk the talk. And people are looking at our lives. If, if, you're de if you've declared yourself to be a, a, a born-again believer, if, you have, if you've declared yourself that, and you've identified yourself that you have accepted Christ, you haven't. For, for God to get the glory, we have to have done that. Okay? Because there's a, lot of good pe there's a lot of people that do good things out there that are lost. I mean, they'll do good things. They'll do it for the wrong reason, but they do good things. So it's important that as we share our faith and do those, those things that reflect the, who God is, reflect Christ in our life, it's important that we declare who we are. Um, so it's important. If you're part of a family, you declare you're part of a family. You know, I call myself Rick Andrews. I'm in the Andrews family. <coughs> Mike Slagle is in the Slagle family. We've got other Slagles here. You have a family. You declare by who you call yourself. When you call it, how do people know that you're in the household of God unless you declare, I'm in the household of God? And that's not in a pious religiosity or a smugness, but it is a matter of fact. I 
have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So with that, it is important that we, that our lifestyle matches what we declare. And, and, and sometimes, uh, when we, you know, and it ought to. And if it doesn't, then we are defaming, and a lot of times we're defaming the name of Christ. Uh, you ever been in a bad mood? Or uh, nobody's ever been in a bad mood with me, right? right? I, I, you know, sometimes you get a, we'll get in a bad mood, or we'll get in a, a, a mood that it's not, it's not Christ like. Our things are going bad. You know, you got bills piling up, or you've got medical problems, or, or something is happening in your family. And if you're rear kids, I'll tell you what, when they're teenagers, no, no, uh, if there's any teenagers here, it's no uh, disrespect to you. But when you're teenagers, and we've all been through it, you're going to have some trials with rear teenagers. And I went through that. I, we, my wife and I, Shirley, by the way, Shirley would have loved to have been here. She, would have, she wanted to come and sing. She's singing for you before. You remember my wife, Shirley? She said she'd be a favorite singer in the whole world. I can say that. She'd love to been here. But we were we raised uh, uh, five children. We lost a child at the age of twelve, uh, Sarah. Uh, we've been a lot through a lot together, and but you know, through all that, the Lord has really strengthened and, and, and drawn us closer together. You know, when we our church family goes through problems together, and you're going to have problems, you're going to have situations. When you do, you draw. What God wants you to do is draw closer together. Through. There's no perfect church, except for the church that is resurrected. But in this life, there is no perfect church. In fact, you look at in your book, book of Revelations, a Revelation, and you'll see the, the seven churches, and all seven of them, not, not one of those churches were perfect. Not one of them. There was not one that was declared perfect. They all had something that God was calling them to. Uh, but anyways, the household of God. So it, it is an intimacy, and we become part of the household to go through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the bottom line. That is, we are part of that household. Now, in this text, the text is declaring that we're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Or what is a stranger and a foreigner? Well, the word, uh, the word foreigner, or stranger, means uh, alien, a person or thing, without the knowledge or without a share in it. It means without a share in it. So, in, in this context, uh, when he's talking about stranger, it says you're no more like that anymore. You're not a stranger. You now have a share. You now have a part in. You are now legitimate. Okay? And, and then you go to foreigners. What is a foreigner? Well, a foreigner is, uh, it, it's, it can mean a stranger. It can mean one who lives uh, in a place without the right citizenship. Okay? Uh, we have a lot of what we call illegal foreigners now, don't we? Uh, you see that border down there along, along Mexico, and you see all, you know, even we even have the, the federal government, government suing the state government. Now, that's almost unheard of, but you, you see that happening. You see all these things happening uh, around in, in, our, in our country. Um, it, but the people that are coming up from Mexico and living here, they're foreigners, unless they gain citizenship. Now, how do they, they gain citizenship? By going through what our government declares is the right process for, ga for gaining citizenship. Uh, we, we gain citizenship. How do we gain citizenship? We gain it by going through the process in which God declares we gain citizenship. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There is only one way that we can legitimately gain citizenship in the household of God, and that is through the Son. There is no other way to do that. So we see this. Um, So that's the definition of citizenship. And um, Webster's, de well, another definition, Webster's de uh, definition is a person native or naturalized of either sex who owes allegiance to a government and is titled to reciprocal protection from it. That, that's another part of our sense of citizenship. We you owe know, allegiance, allegiance to, our, to our country if we're a citizen of the United States of America. We owe that to our country. What is, what is the elements of of what we that obligation that we have 
to being a good citizen of the United States of America. Well, uh, hopefully we vote. You know, that's, that's one of the first things, the obligations that God has given us is to vote. Uh, what are some of the other things that, that God might do? Well, you know, we participate. We participate. We, 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 we participate in, in our community. We participate uh, uh, by being good, good citizens, by being law-abiding citizens, uh, by a lot of different uh, things that we do. Now, I, I wanted to kick off what, I was, what, what I'm going to get into here just establishing that fact. I want to establish the fact. What, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean uh, to be of the household of God? And I want to talk about a family here. I want to talk that Scripture uh, gives us an, a lot of different examples, but it gives us uh, a, a parable. And in this parable, uh, we see that a certain man had two sons. And you, we, we commonly call this parable uh, the parable um, of the prodigal son. Prodigal son. Um, but I want to read this. This is Luke 15, 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and divide it unto him his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and began to be in want. And when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave it to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go uh, to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no worthy more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy higher servants. And he arose and came to his father. Now I wanted to point some things out here in, the, the, in this family that was, going, that, that, that was going on with this son. Now, there's two sons. We're going to talk about both of them. But for a moment I want to talk about this son. Notice this son. Uh, now I'll back up for just a moment. You ever heard the term dysfunctional? We, we hear that a lot today. Dysfunctional family. Uh, we can have dysfunctional earthly families, and we can have functional. Now, not ever, no family is perfect. Okay, no perfect. There is no perfect family. So every family has some level of dysfunction. And and, and that's and I would say the same thing in, in the family of God. We have some level, and it's but it's not. It, it, it is caused by various reasons. And we can, here we're going to look at a couple of reasons what is causing dysfunction in this family. Uh, now, now, I wanted to point a few things out, a couple things out here in verse 12. Uh, this younger son, uh, he, he ignored his family obligations. He had put family obligations, but he ignored them. What did, how did he ignore his family obligations? Well, he wanted his inheritance. Now, when do you usually get an inheritance? usually get your inheritance after someone has died or someone has went on. And that's when you receive your inheritance. When your parents or, or your grandparents or whoever, they pass this life, they leave their inheritance and it comes to the next kid. Well, this younger brother in this family was not, he was, he was in a sense, he was disrespecting his dad. He was disrespecting him because he was looking forward to his getting something that wasn't, didn't belong to him until his dad had died. And then that would only be only if that's what the dad had decided to, have to do. So he, had, he was ignoring his family obligations. Do we ignore our family obligations? That's the question. Do we ignore our family obligations? Do we have, a, do we have an obliga any obligations in the household of God? Right. Yes. What are our obligations? Well, God yeah, says not to forsake the assembly or ourselves as the man or son is. So, uh, you know, we have an obligation to participate we have a, a, in, in the family. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a, just as this son was, you know, you, you, you'll see a family who's sometimes will be you know, a child and they get off, you know, become rebellious. As this child, you see that he became rebellious. But they'll go off and they'll do things and they'll ignore the family, completely ignore the family. And, and this is an example of that. It just completely ignored. 
But you know, we can do that too. We can do that too. We can ignore what God has for us in our family, the family, the, 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 our church family, our, the household of God. Um, number two, think about it this way. His heart was elsewhere. Now, God has called us for our, our hearts to be in tune <coughs> with Him. He has called us to be in tune with His will. He has called, what is the heart of man? The heart of man is your innermost man. That is what makes you tick. That is who you really are on the inside. That's where your heart is. It, it is a, it's, it's an organ in your body, but it's symbolic. When you see the heart of man, it is talking about your innermost being. It's who you are. It makes you tick on the inside. God has called us to intimacy with him. Our hearts are, God has called our hearts to be in tune with his heart. I saw the, um, out in the foyer there, you have uh, a, a verse out there. And it says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. God has called us to that. He has called us to that type of intimacy and that type of relationship. So where our heart is, where our heart is, is where our life is going to be. It's where, it, it's where how we are going to spend our life. Now this young man in this parable, this young man, his heart was somewhere else. It wasn't in his family. He, you know, he was hit obligations in the family. Um, and, uh, you know, he was looking elsewhere. <coughs> to get something that really didn't belong to him so he could fulfill his heart needs. And his heart needs were not in tune with what his fathers thought for. Now, as you, remember this as you read a parable. The parable, there's actually some, there's a story going on that is being shared here. But not only is that story going on, but it is also representative of another spiritual truth. Another spiritual truth. And the bigger spiritual truth here is the call for us to examine ourselves is this, where is our heart? Our, is our heart where God has called us to be? Are we, are, just like the deer that panteth after the water, is our heart panting? Is it longing for that relationship with God? Um, then we see down here, dishonored, uh, another point that I wanted to make here. He, he uh, God, in this choice, allowed this young man his father allowed this young man to make his uh, choice. You know, God will always allow us to make our choices. Even when they're wrong, God will allow us to make wrong choices. You know, why does God allow us to make wrong choices? Because he, want, he doesn't want us to be a puppet on the string where he is directing. That's why he gave us free choice. He wants us to willingly want to pursue him and be like him and put on his character and his nature. Um, so those are some of the points I want to make in verse 12. In verse 13, we see that this, uh, that this son, um, he says, And not many days after the younger son had gathered all together and took his journey into the far country, and there wasted his substance on riot to, riot to living. What is the right, what is this? This is, we, we see that his eyes are on the, the world. Not only is his heart not attuned to God's heart, but now his eye, we, now we, it's revealed where is his heart, where is his eyes, and in in, it is attuned on the world. A far distant country, a way, you know, have you ever heard of the Holy of Holies? Where was the Holy of Holies? The Holy of Holies was, was that most holy place that was in the tabernacle that uh, the Hebrew, uh, that God told uh, Moses to build, and he, and he told the people exactly what, how he wanted to build. It was a pattern. In fact, the, it was a pattern. It was a, it was the pattern that he was. He told the people to use was patterning Jesus Christ. Everything had a, had something to do with the Messiah that was to come. Well, the most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant was inside of um, of this. Uh, room and there was two rooms to the temple. There was the holy place, and that's where all the other all the priests could go into the holy place, and they had their utensils, and they would they would uh, there were certain things that they did there. But but on the day of atonement, the high priest only the high priest could go through the veil. There was a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, and the high priest on one day a year. 
He went in there twice, but he went, it was only one day of a year he could walk into the most holy place. And he could only do that if, on that day, if he did it any other day, he would drop over dead. Because he was in the holy presence of God. And the only way he could go into that most holy place is he had to have the, the, the blood sacrifice with him. If he went into that most holy place without the blood sacrifice, that the, the, the sacrifice was at the, at the front of the gate, and uh, they, um, they slew the, 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 the animal, they would take the blood at the, on the brazen altar, they would take it into the, through the holy place, into the most holy place, and they would sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, or on the mercy seat, which was on the Ark of the Covenant. And this was symbolic, and only the high priest could do that. Now, what happened? There was a veil. This was, this was set. This was a pattern of a set. God was teaching. The book of Hebrews tells us God was teaching these people, uh, the, the Hebrew people, that, that the Messiah was coming. That's all, what all that was, it, what was about. But what happened? What happened um, when Christ died on the cross? The veil was rent. The veil is open. We, we all have access to the most holy place. Well, this, this, um, this son ignored that most holy place. God has called. You know, God has called us to that, to be in his manifest presence as A.W. Tozer said. The manifest presence of God. You know, I, was, I started to, off this uh, message by talking about that mechanical. You know, we can get very, very mechanical in our and become religious in our practices. We, we're saved, but we, we're going through that religious routine. And it's just like that the, the illustration I gave you about the radio. We're, we're not completely, totally, 100% focused on the one who's called us, the one who died for us, the one who bought us with a price at the cross of Calvary. <coughs> this son wasn't. He disgraced his father. This son disgraced his father. He wanted something that wasn't his. He had his, his heart somewhere else. And now he, he, he has his eyes somewhere else. And what's he going to use? He's going to do take what his father worked for and toiled for and gave to his son, and what's he going to do with it? He's going to waste it. He's going to waste it with righteous living. He's going to waste it on stuff, on, on things that don't matter, on the world. Do we do that? Do we ever do that? This is a this is a picture of a really a really backslidden. Now, I want you to notice here. This is not an, this person here is not unsaved. I don't believe he is. I don't believe this, 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 this prodigal son is an unsaved person. I believe, why? Because he's a son. He's a son. The picture is he's a son. He has a relationship with the Father. What do we do with those things that God has worked for? See, we don't work for, the, for our salvation. We don't work for our inheritance. Jesus Christ worked for our inheritance when he came down from he heaven, became man, willingly, and then went to the cross <coughs> for our sins. It was our mistakes, it was our sinful uh, actions that put him on the cross. This son totally disregarded what God did for him <coughs> in his actions. When he has his, he doesn't, when we do not give God our full attention, we, the attention that he is oh, when we we are not completely sold out to faith in Jesus Christ and in relationship and obedience to His Word, when we are not seeking the filling of the Spirit of God in our lives, when we are ignoring those things, the Word of God is teaching us that that is that is disgracing Him. This son disgraced his father.
how much better can we spend to have this son been if he would have stayed home and he would have been a loyal servant to his father and helped him and did, and did, did his service and, and did the things that God was, that his father had called him to do. Um, that, 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 that's what that picture is teaching us here. Um, you know, and simple living never produces that fulfillment of the promises. When we take our eyes off of God and we put it somewhere else, when we put it on worldliness, we, when we put our desires of our heart and we direct it somewhere else, um, you know, it never, it never gives back what we think it's going to give back. It, it, destroyed, it, it destroys our life. You know, and this, sometimes, you know, uh, we need to get to, to that, that point in our life. You know, see this little Jewish boy here, you know, where did he go? He, he got so low that he was feeding the swine. You know, that was a real insult to a, little, a, a young Jewish boy that to feed the swine. That was a real insult. But you know something? When he was at his lowest, when he, when he was after he had, God had allowed him to make the choices he made. He went, you know, when he went out and, um, and, and took his eyes off of God and disgraced the father, and when he went out and did these things, and he, you know, he was with, uh, he spent the money on riotous living. And later on, we'll see what riotous living he was talking about in this parable. But he spent his money on riotous living. Uh, he disgraced God by doing so. Uh, but yet he he got to a point. You know, that's that's the beautiful part about this. You know, if you're a child of God and you make wrong choices. You know, God still loves you. <coughs> you know, do you know, do you understand that all your, when you came to Christ, all your past sins, all your present sins, and all your future sins were nailed to the cross of Calvary? Do you understand that? He didn't just pay for your past sins. He just didn't pay for your present sins. But he paid for your future sins. Everything was nailed to the cross of Calvary. It was all white clean. Every bit of it. But yet, we, when we take our eyes off of God, we will continue in that sin. That sin that it was paid and is continuing being paid for the choices that we make. Now, the call today here is, you know, for every Christian. You know, and this, this, is a, this example is an extreme example. This is really an ex extreme example of, of a person that really took their, their eyes off of God. In fact, he didn't just turn that music down, just, uh, you know, just so he, he had a full blast. And so this is an extreme example, but you know something? I think every one of us, none of us are exempt, are guilty of this. Not to this extreme, maybe, but you know something? God said, God tells us that even a little sin falls short of his glory. You know, we want to categorize sin. We want to say, well, I never, I've never been with a harlot, or I've never done this, or I've never done this bad thing. But you know something? God, it's not the, all these terrible, terrible things. It's most of God's people are, are, are not going to go out and do these terrible, terrible things. But there are. How about how about the how about the poison of the tongue? Anybody ever gossip? You ever shared something with somebody that you shouldn't share with somebody because it was supposed to be private? I mean, even guys are guilty of that. I, I say that. He didn't laugh, but, but that is true. Um, you ever wanted something that wasn't yours? <clears throat> You ever heard of covetousness? Ever been guilty of that? Oh, you see something you really want? But this is the point I'm trying to make. It doesn't have to. These things that we stay just a little bit, have the music just a little, up a little bit, are just as bad as if we pull, we pull that, turn that music up all the way. They're just as bad. And God, and God is, you know, that is what God has called us. I don't, 
rather pump much? I don't want to. What time do you guys usually stop? <laughs> well, you heard it. I mean, I might go on for a while. Well, I'm just going to briefly, all right, that was, some, that was son number one. Son number two, and I'm going to make this brief. Okay, I'm going to talk about son number two. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to son number three, but son number three is important, and I'll try and touch him later on this afternoon, so I'll give you a reason to hang around, right? Okay, son number two. Uh, now, I'm going to I'll get this through you real quick here. Uh, Luke 15, 15, 25. Now that his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house and the, uh, heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry. He would not go in, therefore came out his father and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time at thy commandment. And yet thou hast never given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son hath was come, thou devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and that I have is thine. And, and it was meet with me should be make merry. And be glad, for this is thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost in his found. Now I want just briefly just to say this about the son number two. He wasn't yelled as either, was he? He was jealous, wasn't he? Here, his brother, in fact, where was he when his brother, I mean the Bible doesn't really allude to it, but where was he when his brother made, was making this decision to leave the house? And to go off into the far company. You don't see anything about this brother. You don't see this brother going to his brother and saying, you know, I love your brother and you're, you're, you're not making a wise choice here. You don't see any of this. What you see is at the end, when he comes back, he's jealous because, well, you never did that for me. You never went out and, and, and got a calf and, and, and had a feast for me. And, and you're doing And I've been here all these years. I've been faithful to you. You know, Christian. We can have this attitude too. You know, we can have this pious attitude and this attitude of entitlement. You know, you've heard this entitlement thing with politics. The, the entitlement thing with politics is, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, people. These all these big programs that they have for people, and these people just keep, you know, they keep absorbing and soaking them up, and then after a while, you know, you have three or four generations that are on welfare, and they just you know, figure they're entitled to it. So that's where you get entitlement. Uh, you know something? We can have that kind of, we get that mentality. We can be, we think we're entitled to something. Or we can be jealous of somebody else in, in uh, our, one of our brothers and sisters. If they're getting more attention, or if they're getting a better position, or they're the, this or that. Um, instead of having the spirit that God has called us to have of loving our brothers, you know, encouraging our brothers, you know, that. That is what God has called us to. That, that's one of the functions of the church, or the function of the church. The function to get together and to serve God and to, and to, uh, to glorify God and to worship God together collectively, but also that we can get together and be an encouragement to one another. And if we're not being the encouragement that God has called us to be, then we're not, we're not fulfilling the purpose that God has for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be encouragers. We are to be... Uh, praying for one another. In fact, the Bible says to confess our sins one to another. Boy, I'll tell you what, when's the last time that we've done that? You know, because you're afraid if you confess your sin, everybody else is going to know about it. So you have to pick and choose. You look for brothers of intimacy. You look for people that in your, um, you know, that you can trust. And that's how the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a, a, a group of people that can trust one another. That don't take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and try to make it into something that it isn't. But working together with one purpose in mind. And that is basically what I see as the second son in a nutshell. Um, so this is, this is what I want to say. Um, where are you at in your Christian walk? Where's your heart? Where's my heart? God has called us to something great. 
He's called us to relationship. He's called us to intimacy. He has called us to experience the manifest manifestation of His presence in our life. Not a mechanicalness. He's called the Church of God, the household of God. We're not strangers. We're not. We, we, we have a. We have a obligations. And so that is the call, and that is the call this morning. Where is our heart? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't, none of this makes sense to you because you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Um, if that's the case, then I would, in a moment here, I would, I would be my prayer, and I know the prayer of many people here that you make this day that day a decision. Um, if you're sitting here and you have an awe against a brother, I said you should go to him and, you know, and make it right. If you're sitting here and, you, and, and maybe you think, my attitude hasn't been what it I, had I to be. Today is, the, you know, we have what we call attitude adjustments. Today may be a day of attitude adjustment for you. But we need to, you don't make that to me or to Pastor Schlegel. You make that's between you and God. That is, a, that is, uh, God has called our hearts towards something. He's called our hearts towards repentance and restoration. And that's the, that's in here too, that we didn't get to it. But we see that when, when we repent, and we come and, and we lay our heart out before God, God forgives us. And he, God is set, God is sitting on the edge of his seat. He's looking down at us, sitting at the edge of his seat. And he's, he's saying, come, make that decision. He is our biggest, he is our biggest coach. He is our biggest cheerleader, if you want, you would say. He wants us, he's desiring us to make the right decisions, but he will not make them for us. And so this morning, if, if there's an area of your life, and maybe it's not even something we talk about here, but God has put a thought in your mind, or your, in your heart, that you need to make something right. We pray, I pray, it's my prayer. And you know something, I don't even know why God directed this message the way he directed it for me. I, I thought about this, Brother Sligo called me, uh, you know, a month or so ago, or a couple, I don't know, a month and a half ago or two. And I've been thinking about what to preach on. And, and, and I went through a gamut of things, and this is what came out today. I don't know why. I, I, I only can trust there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. So, I just pray this morning that uh, as uh, we all stand, let's close in prayer.